I think when it comes to building the very close circle of brand lovers, if you want to make sure that you only get the ones on the very top, then this is uh, the, the brand lover experience and they will be the closest uh, for you. So if you can create a community that consists of your most important customers, I think this is something that you simply don't have today. And if you have an NFT collection, for example, uh, they are directly connected to your wallet and you know who you're talking to. So that is a completely different way of collaborating with your community and getting input from inside from the most important customers. So I think this can be something that is extremely exciting and it will make a lot of sense to use blockchain technology for that. Hi, welcome to Unmatched, the podcast that gives you an exclusive behind the scenes access to industry leaders who fearlessly embrace change, pivot from their comfort zones and smash their glass ceilings. Oliver, welcome to the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you today. I'm so fascinated about your story and I want to give also our audience a chance to get to know you. So I don't want to give too much away, but the first question that I want to ask you is, who are you and what do you actually do? <laughs> who are you? And if yes, how many? <laughs> yes. So exactly. here I am. I'm an attorney um, based out of Germany in Hamburg. Uh, I have always worked as an intellectual property attorney ever since I started my job, which was 17 or 18 years ago. Monetization of IP is actually the key of my focus, which means uh, if you have an intellectual property right, for example, uh, and the way you can monetize it, which means through transactions or like licenses or putting it in a pool or whatever it is, it can be patents, trademarks, copyrights. And that is also what brought me into the Web3 space, actually, one of the reasons how we met. Exactly. And I think that's so fantastic because we do have that thing in common. I would love to know before we get to that point and before we get to, to Web3 and all those amazing projects that you're part of today, I'm really curious to know how how did you become a lawyer? Yes. Well, that, that may not sound very... Um, very sophisticated, but my choice. To be very honest, it is something that I'm not. I'm not proud of the way I made that decision, but I, it is. It's part of my story, so I guess I can very well disclose it. Um, I come up from a family with a lot of very capable um, engineers, so it was kind of obvious that my brother and I might as well become engineers. Unfortunately, though, um, we were absolutely incapable of of like managing stuff, putting things together or taking them apart, and we were completely uninterested in doing that. Now, the second thing that um, that we had in mind was uh, how can we kind of have a certain standard of living? Because, uh, like as a teenager, I thought it would be very good to have to be able to afford things when you're grown up. Then, and, and I thought that would be a good motivation. And to be right, quite honest, I thought. You need to be either an engineer, but that was gone. You could do become uh, um, someone in uh, like a, a consultant or studying economics. Uh, you could do law or you could become a, a medical doctor. Unfortunately, I didn't like touching people or being too close to people that I didn't know. So the medical doctor also was kind of gone. I have a two years older brother who studied economics when he left our home. So the only choice I had was to become an attorney or to study law. And I, I'm not sure if I I deserve being in law school and I really was not a very talented student either, but I kind of developed an interest very early for intellectual property and that kind of saved me because taxes was terrible or, or even corporate law, I couldn't stand it. It was too abstract, I didn't get anything of that. But then getting close to, to art, to creation and to, to innovation, that kind of um, got me interested and that is how I well, stayed on board instead of becoming a cook or, or a chef or whatever, instead of uh, studying and continuing my law studies. And it's interesting because I always tell you that you're the most creative lawyer out there that I know and it seems like there was something creative about your journey, about your upbringing. Do you think there was anything creative when it came to your upbringing that sort of led you towards intellectual property was it something in your in your childhood or something that you were doing that was specifically artistic or creative or was it just you know random luck that you ended up there i think it's a bit of random luck but uh, because uh, really by the time i had to find uh, an internship 
Um, I was working as a ski instructor during my uh, my my holiday summer or my my winter holidays as a as a student in university. And one of the clients um, I, I had um, who had his two little boys um, with me as a ski instructor, he was an attorney, and he asked me since I was a law school student if I wanted to come to his law firm um, and well, and do the internship there. And, and that is how I really got in touch with that legal field for the first time. And he actually later became my my boss like almost 10 years later and I'm still he's very he's still a very close friend of mine so intellectual property was fascinating back then and I liked like to to touch or to see or to feel and to sense a piece of art or something creative I, I felt closer to that but I was I was not really a creative person before but then if you think about it maybe this engineer part that always has been there all the the father and grandfather always talking about their innovation to the automotive industry and and combustion engine and direct injection and and airbag and all that stuff that they co-invented as maybe that was something that drove me to i also want to invent or at least be close to creation maybe that's true which is funny because that to me sounds very much like a very german thing you know <laughs> the german typical german story of innovation of creating right how do you look at your German culture and, and the influence that it had on, on this journey of yours? I grew up in the States for the first five years. So I was born in the US um, because my parents, my mother is actually Austrian, my father's German. Um, so that, that makes me only- Explosive mix. Yeah, a very interesting mix maybe. So I got my US passport because I was born in the US. I have an Austrian passport due to my mother and a German passport because my father's German. And which is funny, I still have all three of them today. So when we, my brother and I, when we were kids, we played spies and, and special agents with our real passports. And we, we thought that was very funny. Most part of me um, is German, I would say. Uh, so I grew up in Stuttgart, which is a in, in the Swabian area, very close to the automotive industry, with a very strong culture of having to be very precise, very correct, very reliable, but also keeping keeping things under control, especially for the financial situation under control. So the, the people from the southern part of Germany, from the Swabia, there are people that do not spend a lot of money, or if they do, then only on perfect quality. This is something I think that kind of sticks uh, when you grow up with that. That being part of me is very German. The decision to not stop my studies, even though I didn't think that I fit in, may also have been like German in the sense of, well, I started it and I'm reliable and my parents think that I have to continue, so I will. I don't want to disappoint them. But maybe it was also just, um, well, me being a coward because I, I, I should have spoken up and said, well, maybe I think I should do something more creative, something more fun, and I'm, I'm in the wrong place. It ended up being the right place, but it took me quite a while, to be honest. Take me back to those first years uh, of you being a lawyer. What were the learnings there? What were the experiences yeah. of those times when you were starting out and probably dealing with the reality of, of what being a lawyer is, having this creativity inside of you and at the same time having to stick to the rules, right? Mm -hmm. How was that for you? That felt almost a bit weird, to be honest. When my, my first couple of months, I would say, or maybe even years as an attorney, I felt like I'm completely in the wrong place because I was about 30 when I had my first job. And and that is, I think, at an age where you can even as a consultant be kind of well, secure and say, well, I'm a personality, I will get married now, I will have a family. I'm not the young person running into a gray guy's office and telling them how to run their business, but I have 10 years of legal education on uh, under my belt. So I think it's okay if I start telling you things. Um, I still felt insecure, but I think that's normal for everyone starting their job. And I almost felt a little bit, and I remembered that very well, I almost felt a bit like a hypocrite or like someone who is showing off. When I answered, what is your profession, said, I am Rechtsanwalt. I am an attorney. It's like, if I, oh, have I really said, is that correct? And then, yeah, it's actually cool. I'm, I'm a PhD, super trained, very fancy law firm attorney. And, and it felt completely wrong and I was almost laughing at myself because it, it's, it sounded so much like showing off back then. But then I think, no, wait a second, it's actually true. So I studied hard for 10 years uh, in different countries, got my degree, it was quite successful. Now I work in a huge law firm and I work for fancy clients. 
I think I can be kind of proud of that. It's cool. So let's do it. And then I started having fun about, uh, in, in the job, but it really took a little while where I, th I thought, uh, I'm not sure. Can I say that I'm, I'm an attorney? It felt uh, really weird. Now, I mean, it's uh, 18 years uh, later. It still feels a bit weird sometimes, but it's for different reasons. <laughs> and now I need to get to the question that I've been waiting for a long time to ask you, which is, after studying for 10 years and working for fancy clients, like you say, and being able to call yourself an attorney and with, you know, like the prestige that that gives you, right, especially in Germany, but I guess everywhere in the world, why in the world would you end up in Web3? <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful question. I love it. Um, you know, I have to say that I just actually quit my job with uh, being a general counsel of a very uh, reputable licensing company, uh, which I always had as, as my main client relationship. So it was an outsourced solution. And I immensely appreciate that client, a very, very um, solid company with a long tradition. And what we did was um, licensing intellectual property in patent pools. Uh, standard essential technologies like 3G, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, DVB, MP3 in the earlier days. So really high caliber inventors and innovative companies. And we were licensing all of the smartphone manufacturers, laptop manufacturers, TV set manufacturers, car manufacturers. So that's, that's uh, the, the sort of people I had to deal with. It was an extremely important and very, very innovative way of, of, of monetizing things. But when I saw the development and the dynamic of Web3 and of the blockchain technology and of NFTs and not market wise, but what you could do with it, what it means also for for the way you interact as a company with consumers and how you can exchange with them and make them part of your creativity and and, and token gated communities and all these these buzzwords that everyone knows that really fascinated me. Um, and it fascinated me to a degree that I thought I want to spend more time on that, more time learning about it, more time writing and reading and also publishing and speaking about it. Um, and I felt that the community was so extremely welcoming, maybe because there were so few attorneys, I don't know, or maybe just because they also had the same passion. And, and I felt that is something I want to be part of more than just a side job next to my general counsel job. So Web3 for me really is an opportunity to exchange with creative people with a super positive vibe. I felt that ever since the first day I started being interested in that. Yeah, and I think I, I love being part of a creative process of a innovative process. So it kind of all mixes together. It's creation, it's innovation, it's people again, uh, and it's less the abstract stuff again. It's much more things you can really touch and feel and, and grow communities. So there are so many positive things. That's I think that's the reason. How does it feel to be a lawyer among the a world of nerds, basically? Because <laughs> well, that's a good. <laughs> that, that's just how it is, right? Well, is it? I'm not sure because I'm not sure if I'm. I'm maybe I'm the biggest nerd uh, in in a way um, because I don't want other folks to tell me what to do and I, I want to do I want to make my own choices. And if I feel that a certain group of people is is more uh, what I feel makes me smile, makes me be interested, makes me wonder what that is, and, and makes me curious as well, then for me, it absolutely doesn't matter if they have a degree, if they have a profession that is close to mine, if they have a fancy car, house or whatever, but it is just enormously fun and it is rewarding if you can give something and people say, wow, and it's super, it's great that you spend your time here. So I, I, I have a lot of conversations with people that are completely non-billable. I have two or three hours probably every day that I spend uh, exchanging with folks that I've never met before. Uh, and every once in a while, I meet a person like you, for example, or others that are so so welcoming, so warm and so interesting that you want to follow up and have a further exchange with them. And it's not the first reason because I think I will find a new client. I, can, I basically, and that's maybe, and that, that should not sound arrogant, but I can afford not talking about having new clients all the time. And that is something I 
I kind of owe to the successes maybe that I had before, but I, I use that uh, liberty of making choices that are not driven by the next uh, billable hour. Uh, and that is something that brought me here maybe. And this curiosity and the joy of exchanging with folks is something I, I want to keep as well. And this is the point that I really want to go deeper on because this is the aspect that I'm very, very curious about as well is this transition. Uh, that takes you from a very accomplished position that you have of being, as you said before, a lawyer with fancy clients, which is anyone, you know, what, what any lawyer would want to have, right? It's the perfect situation. And, and then you put yourself into a completely different environment, completely new, totally, you know, unexpected, very creative, out of your comfort zone, I would expect. What is it, though, apart from the curiosity that makes you so interested about the space? What is the opportunity that you see beyond what we see today? Yes. So beyond the, the feel good factors that I just mentioned, and it's, it's all fascinating and, and I'm curious. I do think that there is a business to be had, absolutely. Otherwise, um, it would not, well, let's say I still have a family and a house and, and some uh, uh, things that I need to pay for as well. So it is not that I think it's just for my, uh, for my own um, enjoyment and for my own, uh, let's say, um, uh, spending time on things I can choose. And it's not the luxury of not having to care about money at all. I do think that money can be made and is made. To be honest, I, I do have quite decent client relationships already. It's not yet the same standard of, let's say, return that I had before, simply because I'm spending so much time where I don't care about billing. Um, I could like ha probably have a, a much higher output even now, but I, I don't need it and I don't want it because it will mean that I will really be exhausted every day of work and I don't want to be exhausted of work. I want to be, if you want, exhausted by new experiences or by meeting new people. And I have a very interesting, let's say, uh, result of making new friends and making new connections uh, that will lead to clients eventually. I spend a lot of time um, doing publications, speaking, meeting people, being in workshops or being in, in podcasts and things like that, uh, which means I have shifted from having to bill every hour every day into I do whatever the heck I want as long as it will pay some of the bills and it does absolutely pay the bills. Um, so right now I'm getting in touch with people on very different levels of the creation process. So I get in touch with creators like artists who want to do NFT projects. I'm advising uh, agencies, digital agencies, marketing agencies, advertising agencies that are dealing with the creative process from the very beginning over to executing it for the clients. I have NGOs that I work with uh, as well as platforms for NFTs, uh, but I also have a couple of really um, big enterprises that are building up their competence centers and studios for Web3. And all of that is showing me that there is an interest, there is a development that companies are not curious anymore, but they're investing. They're investing into departments, they're investing into projects, and they need some guidance. And this guidance is something that I, I want to help giving them. Uh, and let's say some of the strategic advisory roles that I already have now with, with fantastic uh, companies are even well leading to further clients and every every time I speak I have new opportunities meet people grow the network and and I just love to exchange with folks on all different levels of the value chain and I guess the switch also came with you being more active on LinkedIn and obviously now you are a little bit of a celebrity on LinkedIn when it comes <laughs> yeah. to legal and web3 there's not anyone else that I know that is a connoisseur of Web3 from a legal and tax perspective. So I'm really curious, were you on social media before or how, how did you start to be more active on LinkedIn? How did that start? Yes, I created my LinkedIn profile and it was my first uh, social media profile I, I ever had. Simple reason for that, before going into Web3 and as part of this intellectual property uh, legal stuff that I've been doing before, I also had a period where I was focusing on press and privacy law quite a lot. So that's also reputation management and crisis communication where people were my clients who had bad press. 
and they didn't want to have the press cover them, their story, and their their person and their identity. So what I told people always is, well, if you make a home story and you invite the press to come to your place, um, it will be very difficult to make sure that everyone leaves the house again. And typically, you opening the door would will mean that you will not be the one having the choice to close the door fully again. So if you are in public, you will be in public, so don't do it or take it. In that company I mentioned before, we were looking for someone to join the legal department because the work was simply overwhelming. We had a lot of big patent pools that we created and just too much work for for, for me as a general counsel. We needed support there. And I thought, uh, since everyone told me LinkedIn is something very good, um, you should have a profile there so you can share it with people. So I started using LinkedIn to connect with people I already know. And I declined every connection request from people I didn't know. So I thought, well, I don't know you. Why, why would you want to be in my network? I don't understand. Because I understood LinkedIn to be something. If I meet you on a conference, we exchange business cards. And then this is like exchanging virtual business cards. I would not just except that someone comes into the room and tosses a bunch of business cards of people I don't know, and I pick them up and put them in my pocket, I would never do that. Only last year, January, February, I think, I actually made my first real post. And I think I had about 500 connections. And then I thought, uh, well, maybe it makes sense to to talk a little bit about uh, Web3, because I I found that people made some statements that were simply not in line with what I thought intellectual property does. So I thought, well, maybe he's here seems to be some misconceptions here. And I just wanted to really kind of almost ask people, so is it true that this is like that? Because at least when I applied the law, actually, this would be the answer. And then I started um, engaging with folks. And I, I, I found that the feedback was cool. And this interaction kind of motivated me to write more, write about myself, and then being a little bit more brave and, and writing even but showing like a piece of art that I made. And I kind of thought, well, I can express myself. This is something where people give you immediate feedback. It's almost like a conversation. And I can make a distinction between real conversations and, and like virtual conversations. It was kind of lifting me up. And now I'm, well, maybe I will reach seven and a half thousand uh, connections or, or, or uh, followers even now. And it's something that just happened. But it's part of this development and it's something I really do enjoy, I have to say. I'm not posting for people to give me warm reactions or feedback, but if I feel like it, I post something. It can be about my job, it can be about, well, politics, it can be about a bird sitting on a, on a bench and doing funny things. I don't care. As long as I feel like doing it, it's okay. I don't need to do it for someone. It's quite ironic, though, because you just started the story by saying, you're opening the door and you're letting people in. And this is what you are doing, basically. This is what we are doing when we are posting and expressing and sharing maybe stories, experiences or feelings or being a bit vulnerable sometimes. How do you feel about it now? Now that you've gone through, you know, maybe 12 months of doing it, coming from nothing to this and, and experiencing also the shift there. How, how does it feel now? For now, it feels good. And uh, it feels good because it's, almost, let's well, say 95, 99% is positive. The feedback you get is positive. The interactions you have are positive. If people try to uh, sell you stuff you don't want, you kind of click them away, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm not too, too bothered by people asking me something I can either not reply or just politely say, well, thank you, that's very kind of offering that to me, but I'm, well, I'm, no, thank you, I'm not interested. Uh, but the fact of opening the door and opening also to the public, which means you you can now be discovered on Google if you so want. And that was not something that really happened before. Before that, I was kind of controlling, as funny as it sounds, I was kind of controlling what I want my image to be because there are very limited uh, pieces of information about my past. That was when I had a performance in my job, when I switched my job, or, or when I had a tennis tournament where I allowed people to kind of take a picture or whatever. But other than that, I didn't have anything about me that was not in line with what I wanted to be, which sounds kind of freaky control, but it was kind of like that. So I said, I, I control my image. And now certainly if you go out and publish so much, you have to accept that people start talking about you. So what is written about you is not 
it's not completely in your control anymore. And um, I don't expect everyone to agree with me or even like me. I, I, don't, I don't care either. Uh, but it is something that where you give away some, some of the control. To be honest, I think for now I can live with it. I still find it a bit funny sometimes when people on conference say, hey, are you this attorney? <laughs> what? what do you mean? So when people kind of think they know you, but you don't know them. That's a bit weird, but also that is something I, I rather find a bit funny, but it's not concerning. Um, if you ask people from my family, for example, or close friends, uh, they sometimes think, well, are you sure that you're doing the right thing? Because you are still an attorney. You have to be a serious person, really sitting straight and, and being there for the client. And now you're having your own image. So what is that you're creating some sort of a personal brand or what is that you're doing there? And why are you doing that? And to be honest, it's something I cannot fully answer, but it's just, it feels right. Uh, it feels like part of this development into a very open community of people that exchange, that are prepared to share uh, this Web3 uh, community, I think deserves uh, being there and being public and also contributing in a way. And this exchange is something that I appreciate and I like that others do the same thing. So uh, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you said something earlier, which I felt was interesting in, in this idea of managing your image. And as, as cheeky and corny as it sounds sometimes, this thing of building a personal brand is what it is. Mm -hmm. And it is sort of happening when you are being more active, right, on a certain platform. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into a more marketing direction now, which is more close to home for me. Sure. But I want to ask you, I'm curious from your perspective of being who you are, having, you know, being a lawyer and also now being more active in this Web3 space. What do you think about this idea of putting yourself out there so that people know you at scale and that, you know, you create maybe not a personal brand, but you create a reputation that is is going beyond the, I don't know, the 10 people that know you uh, in a very close way or that you work with or the 20 people that you interact with through the clients and so on. You have the opportunity to go wide in the true sense of that, of really going global. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective of that in terms of also where sort of the future of work and the future of interacting with people, but also in the future of collaborating with potential client lies ahead? Let's say I think visibility is not necessarily something that is dangerous or that is burdensome. But it, it comes with um, you speaking out uh, and it comes with you taking responsibility. If you do something and you, you're convinced that it's the right thing and you, you have fun doing it and it, it exposes you to a certain well, visibility, vulnerability, I think that's it's fair enough. That's OK. Uh, I can deal with it right now. Maybe you could not if you really are pulled down into the mud maybe one day. I hope that will not happen. But for now, I think that's OK. I can live with it. And I have no problem with being visible uh, in this sense. I, I'm, I'm rather comfortable with myself, so it's okay. Uh, I'm not overly like in presenter mode all the time, but I feel no problem speaking in front of people and being visible to folks when I feel comfortable that I'm doing the right thing. And you mentioned also something earlier about labeling, that your environment was telling you, well, you know, lawyers that are serious don't do this necessarily, or do they? What's your observation nowadays in the market? Is is that maybe also changing that people realize that they have a bigger platform and a bigger you know, a microphone, a virtual microphone that they can use to state their ideas and expose their their opinions on things. Is that changing? I think it is changing a bit. But since I have never really well followed this uh, this space of of public communication in Twitter or, or or LinkedIn or anything, I'm not even sure if that has always been like that. To be honest, I don't know. I would say that most of my attorney friends would rather say. I don't need to be visible because I'm good at what I'm doing and people who want to hire me, hire me because I'm good, not because I'm visible. They don't want to buy an image, at least not my image, maybe the firm's image, because that is a very reputable firm and it has a long tradition. For me, that's that's totally fine. So everyone can make their own decision how visible they want to be. And as, as I said before, like a year a year ago, I would have said if there is a chance to be invisible or let's say not invisible, but not visible to people you don't want to be visible for, um, then that's the right thing to do. 
But now I see it differently, so it's it's my own choice, and as long as it is not harmful for anyone else, I take this choice and I, I can do whatever I want. And only because people tell me that I'm not supposed to do something will certainly not mean that I will not do it, unless it is against the law. But uh, if, if it is against someone else's, uh, let's say, moral compass or what they think is right, then they're absolutely free of having that opinion. I respect that, um, but I would definitely do uh, whatever I think is correct or people that are close to me and may talk to me. I think not many people realize this because coming from the licensing space, not a lot of people know what licensing is, but also I think not a lot of people realize that licensing has a lot to do with brand building. In the end, intellectual properties are nothing but brands. You can be entertainment brands, which are obvious. There can be other brands which are less obvious. How do you see the evolution of marketing and branding in this context of Web3 and Metaverse? Not necessarily of how brands interact or how brands want to launch things, but more like the conceptual idea of brand. Do you feel that that's going to evolve in a, in a certain way, now having this platform and this idea of the metaverse ahead of us? Yes, I think it's going to change dramatically. Um, and the simple reason for that being, or let's say one of the biggest reasons is that there is a lack of enforceability. Um, if you look at intellectual property rights, the key focus of these rights is not a positive one. The key reason for these rights is to exclude others from using that if they have no permission to use it. So it means that the owner of these rights get the, gets the exclusive right to exploit it. And if others do use it, but have no permission to do it, they are infringing these rights, violating, breaking the law. And the person owning these rights has the right to ask them to cease and desist from using it. So this exclusion right is something that is actually the key focus of intellectual property rights. And what, what you and I have been doing is licensing, which is taking out the positive part of it by saying, I have the right to use it and I can share that with others. I can still exclude everyone else, but I want to monetize it by allowing others to use it. And that is something um, that will certainly also happen in Web3 um, in a very different way, I guess, because you can include those who you grant the license to or also the entire community to become part of the creative process. What you cannot do really, at least not now, not in a way you we're all used to it, you cannot really use the negative part of your rights because it is incredibly difficult to exclude people from using your brand in an NFT project, if you don't know where they are, who owns the project, um, who owns the art, and, and getting rid of like deleting or withdrawing from the market something that is on the blockchain. All these things are, they don't really apply. If you are later maybe in some virtual world uh, where it's not even clear which law applies, again, having having clarity over which law applies uh, does not necessarily mean that even if you find a judge in whatever jurisdiction giving you a judgment, that you will be able to actually enforce the judgment and really make the situation stop that is infringing your rights. And I think all of that will show us we need to change the perspective on what intellectual property rights are, the way we perceive them. We cannot think in this cease and desist, uh, granting licenses, black and white kind of culture, but maybe what well, this entire creation process, I think that is something that will change. And this entire perception of what is the original and who is the grantor of the rights and what, what can we do with the infringers is something we will need to definitely discuss and find solutions for it. And do you think that the scope of what a brand means would change in the future? I mean, we today we think, you know, a brand is, you know, the logo, the likeness, the whatever. Do you think that that scope is going to evolve as well to more things? Yes, absolutely. I think or at least depending on where you come from. So if you are a genuine, genuine uh, Web3 brand, for example, take an NFT collection. It has never been a brand before. It is created through the, the NFT project. And all of a sudden there is a brand, a brand that is kind of weird because it consists of pictures of bored monkeys, for example, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but there is something behind it. And that is a community or there it is, it is some development or some sense of friendship or whatever you want to call it, or a, a, a club that you create. It is also something where, you, where scarcity becomes 
become something that is super important because people say, well, if I can own it, then no one else can, then it has value or at least it has value for me. And, and all these things are a bit different than, than before. Um, so traditional brands, for example, if they have a product they want to create from top to bottom, we are the ones making the creations. We determine what the product is. Hey, market, this is our product. You better take it. And then you get cheer and applause or you get uh, like this disapproval. Um, what you typically do not have is that the community creates the product or is involved in the creation of this process and then maybe play it from bottom up all of a sudden by making suggestions how the new product shall be and maybe even giving them incentives to become involved in the creative process or even in new concepts or whatever. So this is something that will fundamentally change, I think. But for example, a brand that I'm also advising is a brand that simply does not make any sense in a virtual environment. Just imagine it is food or it is a lawn fertilizer or it is a like cosmetic product. Why would you want to fertilize your lawn in the metaverse? Why does it make a difference if which sauce you put on your virtual fries or which skincare product you're applying on your avatar? I think if you think about transitioning physical into digital one by one, you will probably fail because it I, I think it doesn't, it's not needed, therefore it doesn't make any sense, and therefore it's superficial and, and just kind of stupid. So what you will have to do probably, you want to create a sense of, of community or create, let's say, the brand lover effect in a different way, transition into something where the community is maybe more important, or create some sort of process where your community still loves you even though they cannot use your product, they don't make any sense. Smelling doesn't work, tasting doesn't work, applying really doesn't make a lot of sense. So you will need to transition into something else so that you and your company and the feeling you want to create and all the emotions you want to create make sense in the digital environment as well. And that is something I think is is different depending on if your company just starts now or whether you're a traditional company. And I guess it sounds very exciting because there's going to be a lot of shifts across the board from, from traditional companies to new companies to old brands to new brands. I mean, I guess there's going to be a little bit of a reshuffle at one point. So I'm, I'm also very curious how that whole thing is going to evolve. And I'm wondering, what's the timeline you think that, you know, it will take all of us to be in the metaverse one day? I don't think we all have to be in the metaverse. If the metaverse is a virtual computer game like 3D world where we have to wear glasses to make it really cool or you can use your screens, I think it will always be, let's say, the less exciting alternative to reality. It may be something that goes far beyond because you can fly, you can be whoever you are or, or however you are um, and you have maybe things like in the in the movie of Avatar, like if you are disabled and you're bound to the wheelchair and now you can run around. I think that's things like that. They will be cool and exciting for some people. They will be very exciting. But for me and most people I talk to, the, uh, the idea of running around in virtual environments doesn't sound all too exciting. So I would rather assume that the metaverse, if there is some sort of a universal metaverse, is rather something like a 3D kind of experience that is happening on top of reality. So I'm much more seeing augmented reality being part of a metaverse kind of experience. Maybe something like an internet you can walk into, like not 100 different internets, but like one World Wide Web in 3D where you can be part of. That is happening like as a live stream. So whenever you, you can go in and go out and it's in real time, but it's rather an additional layer onto reality that you can basically turn on and off. And therefore, I think like, for example, you walk into a conference and you put down your whatever device it is, it's certainly not some bulky thing you will put into your pocket, but some sort of screen that you can put in front and say you have this layer of information. Hey, back there is David, you, you met him last year. And uh, oh yeah, he wanted to follow up. Why don't you just drop him a message? And and this is the person over here, or this is something else that you look outside the window and this is the, the building, what is like, like kind of Google making sense in 3D versions. I think that this will be exciting. It's gonna happen. I don't think that it will be uh, everyone's daily use, but there will be applications that make a lot of sense and that will especially replace devices. I think that's the most important part. So we're not going to end up in a weird matrix 
anytime soon. Well, at least I most likely will be cooking some stew during that time when everyone else is showing up there. <laughs> Definitely. How about from a utility perspective? Because we haven't really talked about utility that much. And of course, like 3D and exciting experiences in the metaverse is one thing, but then there's the aspect of utility, right? And from that perspective, I'm just wondering as a lawyer, right? Thinking of this from a very technical point of view and from a very business oriented point of view, where do you think is the opportunity for businesses and companies and people to get into more of the utility space that we're not actually being, we're not using very much uh, still today. I think when it comes to building the very close circle of brand lovers, mm -hmm. if you if you think about it in a, in a pyramid, so your consumers of a brand, for example, they are the the very top, very very small uh, peak is the ultimate lovers of your brand. They're almost your ambassadors and they will identify themselves and always speak positively. And then you, it goes further down. So you have more and more consumers, but the further down you go, these are people just looking for the cheapest product or for the new update or just well, hopping from one brand to the next. If you want to make sure that you only get the ones on the very top, uh, then this is uh, the, the brand lover experience and they will be the closest uh, for you in this case. So if you can create a community that consists of your most important customers, I think this is something that that you simply don't have today. It may come through some loyalty programs, but it's not the same thing if you have like a bonus card system or you make people part of your company by appreciating their contributions, by inviting them, by having a direct link that you typically maybe have because you don't have that because they buy the product in the shop. You don't even know who is buying your product. And if you have an NFT collection, for example, they are directly connected to your wallet and you know you're, who you're talking to. Um, so that is a completely different way of collaborating with your community and getting input from inside from the most important customers, even though they're the smallest portion of your customers, for example. So I think this can be something that is extremely exciting and it will make a lot of sense to use blockchain technology for that. I think in all these value chain and creation processes in uh let's say in, in supply chain questions when it comes to authenticity or to proof of something proof documentation i think blockchain technology will be extremely useful when it comes to replacing uh, the need of exchanging goods but you can exchange substitutes instead and create transparency that is something where i see an enormous use case when you can replace public registers for example that is something that make a lot of sense so i see a lot of use cases in very different industries from brand creation protection community work over to the technical aspects of supply chains all the way through how public registers and and even identity can be represented so I'm, I'm I'm not concerned at all that this will happen, uh, and I'm I'm absolutely sure it's just a question of time if all of that will come. Do you think this will completely change industries, like for example the music industry, or I can think of real estate, for example? Do you feel like smart contracts would take over real contracts anytime soon? No, I don't think so. I think that smart contracts will. Uh, I mean, ultimately, smart contracts are still code. So they're computer language. They may be called smart contracts because, in fact, they represent something that people want to happen. So, for example, we say if A happens, then B will automatically be triggered. But that does not yet make a contract. It's just something that a consequence that you pre-program will be self-executed. What you take out is the middleman making the decision, hey, has A really happened? Because I may hold back B until I really know. So this is something where this funny term of trustless or permissionless or whatever else, this, this less comes in that I completely misunderstood when the first time I, I heard it, that the blockchain shall be trustless transactions. I said, well, why would people want to interact with something they cannot trust? But the fun thing is they don't have to trust. The trust is not required for this process. So if A happens, then B will automatically happen, even though you don't need to trust anyone in the process of a, between A and B, because it is just something that we predetermined and you do not need trust. So it's trustless. That is something I never understood, for example, but whatever. So 
Um, that is agreements not being replaced by smart contracts, but they are. Uh, that's a supplement. That is a way of ensuring execution. So I don't think that either lawyers nor contracts will be eliminated or replaced, but you will still need both of them. Smart contracts are a super interesting way of changing a couple of industries, of removing intermediaries, of removing this requirement for trust where it is more of a hindrance and not an enabler um, and where people want to sit on their own assets and have self-control over what they own. I think that it will be a very disruptive uh, situation for some industries. Financial industry, for example, may be one of them. Also, everything that needs an intermediary or where huge companies benefit and those who actually create the processes or, or, or the asset are underrepresented in the economic benefits. And it's fair enough if these situations are cracked open and, and left uh, in a different way. And I'm looking forward to these changes, actually. Yeah, me too. I think it's very exciting and it's very interesting to observe from the sidelines in a way. It's, it's definitely, I understand it's exciting to be part of the space as well. And so I'm wondering how you see your next few years ahead of you because again you've been a person very curious about things you know you've you've had one career already which you continue as well to do but now you've stepped into a second career what's the next thing what's the next thing for you oh i'd love i'd i'd love to know that myself sometimes i think staying curious and watching things develop is something that i I will definitely want to continue to do, which means right now from a business perspective that I'm getting introduced to more and more startup opportunities where I can become part very early, either as an advisor or as a consultant. And sometimes using the connections I have to interesting young companies to become a shareholder early. I think that is the way to phrase it correctly. I would want to grow that further. When it comes to legal advice, maybe I will stay in my own little firm that I have right now and be a consultant just here and there. Maybe it means that I will join a super interesting opportunity that, that is presented to me for an innovative company or maybe if a company like Disney, for example, if they called and said, we're growing our web free studios, this is a guy who knows about licensing legal and he has fun doing and exploring other things. Just as an example, that might even be something I, I might be interested in because it's super disruptive. It's changing the entire way this business is going. It may even happen that I join a big law firm. So I, I don't really know. I let's say I'm open to exploring what will happen next and I'm not afraid of the future at all. So one way or another, I'll find uh, I find my slot where things are moving the right direction. And um, do you think you need a purpose to be successful, or is it okay to just follow a path that you are put on, and you know, kind of that will take you somewhere? Do you do you feel like purpose adds anything to that journey? I think it's useful to have a purpose, but it's not not necessary. And I don't think that every client relationship is based on purpose. It, like in my particular case. It is based on a client having a problem and wanting you to solve it or um, having you, well, wanting you to be the person they want to exchange with. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I don't necessarily need a purpose for everything. If you speak about your long term things where you can have the, the impact and you're the one influencing it and you can give the direction. I don't even think that purpose is something super necessary. It is more again, being convinced that what you're doing is the right thing, that you're not creating moral um, implications for other people that are uh, inappropriate. Uh, certainly you want to be a role model for your kids, so you shouldn't start doing things that you you would not want them to see or to, to behave in the same way. But other than that purpose necessarily, I, I do like some clients more if I know that they have a purpose. Uh, so if I can serve their purpose, so one of my biggest clients is the WWF, the World Wide Fund for Nature, for example. So whatever they do, that feels good because it's kind of their purpose and I support their purpose, but it's not my purpose. So if I don't want to change my profession to become the president of WWF, because it's it's not my, it's, I can help them, I can support them, I can donate, and I can uh, well, be their attorney. But I don't need to copy their purpose. And I think my own purpose is to be a decent attorney and a decent person, great friend and father and husband, hopefully, and son and brother and whatever. Uh, that would be my 
purpose if you so want, but that's not business driven. And you forgot one important one, which is Dagen Lawyer. Yeah, my DJ. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Warrior Lawyer. <laughs> yes, certainly. And to be a DJ Lawyer, that's very important as well. Oliver, it was a great, great pleasure to talk to you today and to learn more about the person behind the fancy lawyer experience and the and the great experience, obviously, that you have. And it was really, really nice to hear from you how your curiosity led you to where you are today. Thank you so much for taking part of our podcast. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. And as you can see, I feel very comfortable with you. So exchanging with you makes me disclose all sorts of things. Thank you very much, Wanda. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for tuning into Unmatched. Remember, building an unmatched brand is not just about success. It's not about popularity. It's about creating something truly remarkable that reflects who you are and what you stand for. So keep pushing yourself to go beyond what you think is possible. Keep taking risks, challenging yourself, and never settle for standard. And if you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest episodes. Until next time, keep being unmatched.